Okay, wonderful. I know, as always is the case, we get quite a few people who join a few minutes in, uh, and I know some have to leave uh, a few minutes early, but it's always good to just uh, jump right in because the hour goes by quick. My name is Eric Alexander. I'm the uh, executive director of the Brigham Education Institute. I just want to welcome all of you, both local and within the Brigham system and within the Harvard Longwood area, and then those of you outside of that, uh, including those regionally and nationally and internationally to join us. It's just a pleasure uh, for this talk in particular, I'm going to actually just make a few quick introductions before I turn it over to Dr. Nareth Carlisle for the formal introduction of our speaker. Next slide, please, E. I I just want to put it in context, of course, this now is uh, the third in the fifth and five here of our series on artificial intelligence as relates to medical education. We had the basics talk early on, we had the promise and hopes, which we gave last, and now we're going to really see the applications in the real world from those around us in industry and educational partners. I think this is going to be a really practical uh, view of what's going on, and uh, of course, Nareth will give a broader introduction. Next slide, please. I welcome you as well to join any of our medical education research uh, sessions here ongoing. Uh, all of these hybrid or virtual, so allowing anyone to zoom in over the course here of the full academic year. Next slide. And also, when you ever want to grow your medical education knowledge, we have a very much a no prep, easy to join session where we are review and discuss um, an academic medicine's last page, a topic in medical education where we grow our own understanding of pedagogy or assessment or whatever the topic is. And we have our next one coming up. Um, uh, on Friday, November 12th. Next slide, please. And finally, our international community of educator meets about monthly to have a cup of coffee virtually together. And it's always a fun session of about 20 to 40 of us. Join us November 17th. With that, just a few comments here. We do record this session for others to be able to see into the future. If you're not comfortable with your video on, simply turn it off. Also, we do monitor the chat box actively. Uh, Christina Dezara here is our chat box moderator. Uh, please put in any comments that you might have or questions, uh, and that's often a lively conversation as well. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Nareth, uh, to really, again, uh, discuss the series and then also introduce our, uh, our speaker. Thank you, Alina, for joining us. Wonderful, thanks so much, Eric. Uh, thanks everyone again for joining us here today. I'm delighted to be able to introduce Dr. Alina von Davier. Dr. Von Devier is a psychometrician, and she's a researcher in computational psychometrics, machine learning, and education. She's served in numerous editorial and advisory roles, and she's extensively published in these areas. She's also currently the Chief of Assessment at Duolingo, and I'm delighted to welcome her here today to share her insights with us on applications of AI to assessment. Right, Dr. Von Davier? Hello, Narat. Uh, thank you for the kind words and for inviting me to be here. It's a pleasure to share some of my work with all of you. Uh, today, I will be talking about how we think about assessments in the time of change and in a time of uh, taking advantages of advances in technology. So I'm going to share my slides with you in a, in a moment. And I... Uh, and then I will present uh, my work today. So here we are. Please confirm that you can see my screen and that you can also hear me. We can see it fine and we see the, um, the full presentation. Wonderful. So I prepare a presentation for you today that gives an overview on how assessments that are perhaps still considered more innovative, make use of artificial intelligence to democratize education. So this is part of, um, of the reason why we are doing this. And in my presentation today, and uh, again, I'm looking also forward to discussing all of these issues with you, I will also present a bit more about Duolingo because it is to my knowledge, uh, the only assessment that includes artificial intelligence from end to end, from the development of each question to scoring and reporting. 
This is also why I put here the mission of the DT itself, that's the Duolingo English test, use assessment technology to lower barriers and increase opportunities for English language learners everywhere. And I think this is important because again, we are making um, the point of having our test be very accessible. And with that, uh, we need a uh, other technology tools to help us reach out to that many students at a really low cost as or as low as possible. So the outline of my presentation today is to talk a little bit about the why. Why are we doing this? Why is it necessary even to consider artificial intelligence for assessment? Then I will introduce what is called digital first assessments, and I will give an overview of that. And since my background is technical, so I work in psychometrics and I develop tests, I analyze the data from tests, I design tests of all types. But now in for the past 10 years or so, I've been working in bringing in tools from other domains, such as from computer science and uh, strengthen what psychometrics can do for assessment and learning and education in general. And just to give you a flavor of how artificial intelligence can help, I have two examples. One is from the Duolingo English test itself, where I will talk about how we use artificial intelligence tools to develop the questions and the test. And the second example is uh, HERA, Holistic Educational Resources and Assessment, is a project of mine from uh, my previous team with, that I've developed with my previous teams. And it's about a formative tool for learning and assessment that also includes the assessment of uh, confidence, how confidence learners are when they respond to uh, about the correctness of their response within quizzes and within assessments embedded in this learning system. So why are we even considering these changes? Well, everything around us is changing and the pandemic, to be honest, just made this transition extremely uh, much faster than it would have been otherwise. Pretty much our life in the past 18 months moved online. I mean, including what we are doing right now. So everything around education and learning and workforce has been redefined by technology. Um, and the interactions between computers and humans, human and human within the digital, this digital environment, intelligent tutoring system, educational games, all of this just changed the way we think about education uh, nowadays. We've also encountered, and I'm really uh, fortunate to have had the opportunity to work at this convergence of fields, artificial intelligence on one side, but also other tools, so statistics, engineering, cognitive science, psychology. So all coming together to create new ways of reaching out to our uh, learners, students or adult learners and uh, helping more people uh, pro having access to quality education. Another thing that has changed in many ways is that, yes, we still need the basic, we still need reading, writing, arithmetic, and so on, uh, and science, but we need those skills within a slightly different context. And this is what is we call nowadays digitally mediated context, uh, including what would happen, say, in medicine. Yes, you still want the medical students to be able to respond to questions about uh, different diagnostic uh, procedures, but you also would like them to be able to do so in telemedicine, so in a digitally mediated environment. And as you, as it is definitely of interest in for you in medicine, but also for um, schools in general, we are also interested in fostering other type of skills, interpersonal skills, collaboration. And once we move into a digital environment, all of these skills need perhaps slightly different 
uh, approaches and uh, the tools for communication become, uh, you know, chat boxes, uh, emojis, and, um, you know, just different ways of interacting with one another. Now, the problem with all of that is that if we stay within our paradigm of traditional assessments, then these new changes, these new type of skills are very hard to measure. Why? Well, let's say we move, if we don't move um, online and we still use paper and pencil, we we, it's much more difficult to find out what's the process by which a, a learner arrives at the conclusion. So we are looking for ways in which we can capture the process used by test takers to respond to questions. We are also interested at identifying non-cognitive behaviors and perhaps giving student learner test takers the right feedback to help them with increasing motivation or self-control. And again, we are very interested in affective states because we know that they influence interpersonal interactions and we would like again to be able to provide this feedback in formative assessment, for example. So how are we going to do that? What is a potential solution uh, to some, some of this uh, larger uh, puzzle that need to be solved? Well, one of them, especially for assessment, is what we call nowadays digital first assessments. Sometimes uh, they are called intelligent, and the reason they are called intelligent is because they are adaptive. And uh, they, you know, they are a bit, they are nimble and adaptive and, and shorter. So I will say a bit more about that. Uh, but what distinguishes them from the traditional assessments is that they are designed with computational models and artificial algorithm, intelligence algorithm in mind from the beginning. So they are end to end a different type of assessment, even if the activities are in principle similar, but the way we do that is very different in, a, in this digital first uh, assessment. We are doing all this uh, um, technology enhanced design and development, but we are still very careful to make sure that our assessments are evidence-centered and that they are valid and reliable. Another feature of these assessments is that they are very well integrated. We have a fluid infrastructure. We can deliver the test in pretty much any time, anywhere. But in order to do that, we need different frameworks to work very well together, to be integrated. And all these tools that help us scale up and reach many, many students all over the world also need to be very well integrated across different theoretical frameworks that we bring together. Another specific feature of digital first assessments is the fact that they are test taker center. It's a bit more than just the UX. It's also about um, availability, providing access anytime, okay. anywhere. Um, it's, about, it's about providing the test online and having eventually uh, uh, having the test be evaluated using remote proctoring. And I will give more examples about that, especially on how Duolingo addresses some of these issues. So one of them, a big part of what we are doing is to redefine how we can develop the questions and the whole test using new tools, how we can change the paradigm of test development in a digital first uh, assessment. So first, we want to make sure that we have a good theoretical foundation for the test development. And we use what is known in the assessment industry as evidence-centered design and expansions of it. We use a common European framework of reference for language assessment. In our case, you could use something else in medicine, for example. And we use computational psychometrics as, a, uh, as an analytic framework in which we combine artificial intelligence tools with the psychometric requirements such as validity and reliability. Now, in a digital first uh, test development, we could in principle create uh, other 
aspects of the test that will reach to towards in being more, making it more holistic, making it formative, making it um, uh, um, also a uh, social emotional learning and assessment tool. Again, not for all parts, not for all assessment, but in principle, it's possible to do that. And this will be my second example today. It's adaptive and it's, we generate the items automatically. We have the subject matter experts at SMEs that design the items, that provide uh, and score the items, design the content, provide the first iteration of the items. And then we use artificial intelligence to scale up the production of many, many items. And we use a, we integrate a digital facet into any measurement, be it STEM, being language testing, being medicine. Other possible extensions could be to include games and simulations, but also say chatbots and collaborations with a chatbot or make use of uh, augmented reality and uh, VR. But most importantly, the tests still need to be valid and reliable as the traditional test used to be. And I will talk more about those. This, is, this slide here presents pretty much a way in which uh, digital first assessments are designed with artificial intelligence algorithms from the beginning till the end. So you can see there is a strong combination of expertise here and strength. You have the human subject matter expert that brings in the design and evaluation from the beginning till the end. And then we have the AI algorithm and psychometric models that help again from the beginning to the end. It's a very different way of putting a test together than how we've been doing it in the past. Also, most importantly, the test taker experience is at the core of every decision. And this is really different from how the traditional assessments were designed. They were never about comfort and availability uh, or for test takers. They've been always about rigorosity and about the validity of the test, which I we definitely agree should stay. But now the technology, uh, especially the affordances of the technology, uh, allows us to make the experience much more uh, comfortable so that many test takers perhaps will feel less stressed uh, when they are taking these exams. As you all know, a test is always quite, um, uh, you know, uh, anxiety inducing. So if there are things we can do in improving that experience, we believe uh, it can help test takers receiving better, uh, uh, having more success in assessment. Now I talk about computational psychometrics um, and, and this is an important way for us to think about the design of the test, the inclusion of AI tools and the evaluation of the test. And what is it? It's really in a simple way, it's, it's, it's a blend of machine learning algorithm and psychometrics uh, and learning theories. Uh, it is psychometric centers, it is theory-based, it is also data-driven, so we use multiple types of data sources, large data sets. We use the process information on how people respond. And it's also algorithm empowered. It's adaptive, it's computational, uh, computationally efficient, and it relies on a functional alignment between the inner and outer systems that I showed you before in the table. So this is another way of looking at it. And what you see on the right side here, we have the telemetry. That's all the data that nowadays with some of this assessment, we are able to uh, collect, say pixels from the video interview or, um, uh, or text from writing assessments. And we have the next level is to extract features. And then we go higher up to higher level constructs in order to go from feature extraction to higher level constructs. Here is where 
we we nowadays use machine learning. And then we go back up to the cognitive learning and psychometric models and check whether those models fit the data. So, and there is an uh, iterative process here because sometimes we discover new features that were not captured in uh, the original theory-based models, and we want to take advantage of those. One big insight for us, and has been already for a few years now, but it's really helpful, is that we can look at content like questions that are put on the test or uh, learning materials, all of that can be seen and coded as data. Not, not unlike Google is using all the text out there and the videos and the images, all of that is data. And if we start thinking in that way about our learning and assessment content, then that opens for us a lot of opportunities. And here again, where natural language processing tools become super useful for item development, for tagging the items, tagging the type of content that we have on items and in learning, for classification of content, and also for building what some of you might have heard of, Q matrices, which are um, matrices that indicate what skills are needed to respond to different questions as part of a cognitive diagnostic model analysis. And once we, we have that way of saving the data and looking at the content in that way, we can combine the items and instructional content metadata and create a system for that includes both learning and assessment. And it helps us align the testing instrument and these instructional tools, including videos, hints, items, feedback, and so on, through theoretical taxonomies, such as a common um, uh, uh, CFR, the Common uh, European Framework for Languages, or uh, here in the United States, it can be the Common Core Standards for school uh, content. So I want to give you an example on how we do that in uh, uh, using these tools, especially thinking of content as data. So what we have here is how traditionally, I mean, these are activities that are necessary to build a test. You have expert written test items, then you pilot those items, then you do psychometric analysis, and then you put your items in a pool of test items. But this, this is really time consuming, it's expensive, and those type, uh, you know, those pilot data um, are not necessarily reflective of the population for which the test is going to be uh, used. So what we are all, also in the traditional test development, we are, you know, doing this piloting using many, many, many test takers. And we are trying to make sure that the ability of these test takers, it's matched by the difficulty of individual questions on the test. And we use different theories to match, to do this matching and to estimate where a particular score, a particular ability for one person will be for the new test. And this is an example, this is a formula for a um, the likelihood uh, uh, log likelihood function for uh, estimating the ability in a theory that is called item response theory. Uh, so this is a traditional way of thinking about, uh, about piloting and about getting, constructing the test. What we've been, and my colleagues, especially the uh, machine learning engineers have been thinking about whether we could bypass this by using machine learning and NLP tools, at least as a, what we called cold start, as at least as a way to start the analysis. So instead of going out and piloting on a lot of students and getting all this data, uh, can, we, can we move a bit quicker? Can we get good estimates to start with and then update them as we go along? So here is how this has been designed. 
So we use all of these processes, expert annotated text. Remember, our test is an English uh, assessment. So we have expert annotated CFR tests and word lists. And we use statistical models for the estimation of that CFR difficulty estimation. We also have natural English language resources. And then we have different item generation techniques that use machine learning in general. And then using all of this together, we create large pools of items that are uh, aligned to the theoretical framework, and they are going to be used for an adaptive administration. So this is one example in which AI is useful for assessment. Now I'm going to give a different example. This is, um, this is an example for formative assessment. Um, the trends now are to create assessments that are holistic, engaging, gamify, personalize, provide diagnostic, give people recommendations, and have analytics and dashboards, both for eventually learners, but perhaps also for instructors, and the delivery has also to be uh, convenient and comfortable for the learner. Again, from a test developer perspective, the power of all of these uh, issues and items is in the integrations of tools and frameworks. So let me give you an example. If we wanna build a, um, an assessment that is interactive, uh, perhaps where people would communicate with each other in a virtual environment, solving uh, complex problems, or even for um, mis early childhood uh, assessments or middle, sc middle school assessments, where let's say you would like them to play a game or, or do simulations in chemistry or do simulations uh, in physics. So if, if we think of the type of the design of that, that assessment, and then the type of data that we are able to collect, then what you see here is again, a very hierarchical um, tool, not unlike, it, which is exactly like the uh, computational psychometric uh, figure with the pyramid with, and the telemetry. So what would be then the data from such an assessment? It will be definitely multimodal. Here on the right with 0101, we have the, say, responses to traditional questions, incorrect, correct, incorrect, correct, and so on. But let's say we also have uh, audio exemplars from test data. We can, they can respond to questions, say, for an English assessment, that would be quite valuable. We may have, say, 3D uh, examples here, or we, or we may have a video of a test taker responding to questions or interacting with others. Now, when we have this type of data, audio or video, then the data is at a very fine level. For video, for example, we are talking pixels. Now, obviously, on one side you have pixels and on the other hand side you have zero one, so correct incorrect responses. So that's, as you can see, it's a really big difference in, in the level of aggregation. So this is actually why we need tools that are outside the traditional psychometric tools. And here is where say data mining becomes very uh, important. How can we mine this pixel level data and, and sound bites data and identify relevant low level features for these pixels? That can translate into facial expressions, gestures, speech prosody, for example. And then even with that, it's still quite a big difference between having facial expression and having zero one responses, correct, incorrect responses. So we need one more level, which would be what is called in artificial intelligence, like mid-level representation. So we are trying to look for patterns at this level and to understand how this facial expression come together to express, for example, emotions or engagement or a particular state where they are in. Uh, and only after that, we can bring them 
these emotions or uh, identifying the engagement of a person with those responses zero one and then that's where they finally can come together and become input data for our high level interpretations and here is where various models can be used could be Bayesian networks, could be something else, uh, depending on the application, of course. So in order for the system to work well, it is best to have an evidence-centered design or design principles behind everything we construct so that the data that we collect is within a theoretical framework. One example of this uh, evidence-centered design is also an extension, is an extension from a uh, design, evidence-centered design applied to a static assessment, such as say the SAT, uh, to a dynamic assessment when you want to build a formative assessment where you might have a change in the ability during the measurement uh, windows. And there are some other changes here, such as designing the task, which could become much more complex so that it can elicit the right type of evidence about how a particular test taker or learner um, understands the question, responds to the question, so that we can eventually identify misconceptions. So another an ex concrete example that I work on, on with my previous team is HERA, Holistic Educational Resources and Assessment. And it's a system and we develop it for science purposes. Um, and you can, I will share the slides and if you are interested, you can go and check these links as well. So this has been a, a prototype, an MVP actually, it was more than a prototype. We brought it up to MVP level. Um, the idea was to bridge assessment and learning using science simulations as a context. We built adaptive scaffolding for students so they could choose uh, the level of adapt uh, adaptivity, how much feedback they would like. We had an adaptive sequencing of the questions that we gave them. It was gamified. For example, we, including, we included uh, a system of points uh, that they could use to get feedback because the uh, previous research showed that many children, in this case, it was built for middle school. So many children or, uh, or learners tend to look for ways to, uh, you know, play the system, game the system, and, uh, and they abuse the feedback. So what we did, we created a system of points where they would get points uh, when they respond correctly, but then they will need to uh, pay points in order to use different levels of feedback. Um, and then we included the confidence measurement. In other words, how confident are you that the response that you, you gave uh, is it's, it's correct? Uh, and we, why did we do that? We, because research also tends to show that there is a, a discrepancy between, say, uh, different minorities, especially women, um, and how confident people are about their responses. And, uh, and we also know that there are some other groups of people who are overconfident and it's not healthy either way. So we think that having an, an environment in which they can check uh, and calibrate themselves with respect to confidence and correctness of the response, uh, we think that that could be helpful for their healthy uh, development uh, and learning uh, success. Um, it looks like the slide might not be as clear as I wished it to have, I took a picture from uh, from it, but I want to. Uh, I, what I want to emphasize here is a part of the design. So this is not about AI. This is about the, the other part, the the psychometric part. Like how do we design the item? Uh, and we have here, uh, you know, uh, three types of feedback that we design, and we ask the students to the test takers to choose which level they would want, re-paraphrase, break it down, or teach me. 
And they all look for, so all of these situations are about targeting a particular skill, looking at proximal precursor and helping them understand. So putting it in a context. Uh, and of course, Teach Me it provides the whole teaching uh, pedagogical approach from um, context to looking at what's the next level that they need to learn, what's the distal uh, uh, level that they need to study, sorry. So here is an example of how they would receive a question, then they will be able to use this table here on the left uh, and, and collect data and try multiple times. And then uh, we have the, the question itself where they will need to respond. Now, if they don't know uh, how to do it, they could ask for either of this uh, type of feedback that I showed before, and they could also just try again. So here is also on the right side what I just told you. They can choose these three types of feedback. There is this cost, this gamification here um, that you need to pay different points for different types of feedback. And then there is a question about confidence. How confident are you in your response? Uh, so with that, I would like to conclude my overview here. So I, I try to show several things. I wanted to communicate with you about the new directions in assessment from my perspective. To talk about digital first assessments that want primarily to reach out to as many people as possible from all over the world and still maintain the quality of measurement, which is really, really important. Um, I talk about computational psychometrics as an integrative framework for supporting the systems. Um, I emphasize that both computational models and data-driven algorithms can be used for test development and therefore scale up the development of tests in a way that that is much more makes the test more affordable for test takers and i gave two examples one is the duolingo english test and how we use ai tools to develop the test and the second example is uh, hera on how we would design uh, learning and assessment i i guess i could have added for hera that we use artificial intelligence to uh, make the uh, the sequencing of the items adapted. So depending on how people respond, what type of feedback they use, we use that information to choose the next type of items that, uh, that the students need. So both examples use AI tools, but in, in different ways, in different applications. So just to conclude, it is still true. Uh, this uh, quote uh, has been uh, attributed to William Gibson, and I really like it. And it's really true. The future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. So there are some places where you have this, uh, this digital first assessments, and there are still places out there and exams out there where the tests are given on paper. Uh, technology companies definitely are changing the paradigm for assessment. AI is changing pretty much all disciplines. Uh, however, the psychometrics and learning sciences are also here to stay. And you get the best results if you use both. You take the strength from each of them and, and you combine them. Now, I need to emphasize that unfortunately, the ed measurement programs are not quite preparing their students for being the psychometricians of the future. So the, the med measurement programs still tend to be designed for last century assessment. So one solution to speed up a little bit the training of the future psychometricians is to consider internships and fellowships with ed tech company, companies and help them see other ways in which assessment can be designed and evaluated. Uh, and with that, I want to thank you all for your uh, attention. And if you have questions, please let me know. 
Dr. Van Davia, thanks so much for that uh, amazing overview. I think it's uh, you know tantalizing in exactly where we were hoping to to sort of have our eyes opened. You know, in previous sessions, Eric had shared with us um, you know his views as a master clinician and educator. Um, what are each of the areas that we were we're hoping that AI may be helping us? We talked about you know, generating content and curricular assessment, which still is, can be quite a painful process with an expert driven approach. Um, and then getting into the actual assessments and then and then assessing readiness for the next transition when when physicians are ready sort of to practice independently would be areas. I think you've shown us some areas where, you know, even rethinking the, the content development part where you're applying AI. Sounds like you're also doing so much with the data that's being generated by it. Medicine doesn't necessarily have the same scale that English language learning has across the world. And um, I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit in areas where we may not have the same level of scale. Do you think that AI and machine learning techniques could still be used? I think it's interesting that uh, you are saying that medicine doesn't have that scale. I, I would have thought <laughs> medicine is probably, uh, you know, perhaps after math, English and then math and then probably medicine would have been my next guess in terms of scale. Um, I believe that uh, that there are a lot of possibilities for medical assessments as well. Uh, medical assessment take we use a lot of situational based tasks. For example, you as a test taker, you are uh, asked to evaluate the symptoms of a particular patient, and then you are supposed to you know ask questions, appropriate questions, and then uh, zero in towards a diagnostic um, uh, result. And I think this type of scenario, what ha that's how we would call it from a psychometric perspective, scenario-based task is actually a good um, example of items and tasks that can be generated automatically. So uh, I, I'm very positive that this is pos uh, possible in medicine. There are actually some papers on automatic item generation in medicine. And um, yeah, again, the future uh, is uh, already here, just not <laughs> evenly distributed. Great, thank you so much. And Eric, I think you had a question. And then Christina, if there were any uh, questions that had emerged, we'll go to you next. Alina, that was great. Uh, I have uh, as much a reflection and would love your reflections on it, but I was um, I was struck a little bit um, by how you were describing um, artificial intelligence <clears throat> improving the process, uh, of course, of assessment and, and thereby learning. But at the end, you were very much were making a point which resonated with me, which is um, how much it is still important to ground this with kind of core learning uh, processes, and in particular, what does the learner want and how do they best engage? Um, and I was struck by they can choose the three different options, <clears throat> a full explanation, a stepwise, you know, um, proximal kind of clue, and, and the third one. And, um, and, I, and I think that just probably is probably, for me, one of the biggest take homes. And then I'll just ask if, I, <laughs> if you would agree, which is, as, as good as a artificial intelligence model is, it's still always gonna be grounded in kind of that core issue that we're dealing with humans. And so acknowledging uh, their desires and how best they engage is probably still gonna be critical to this. Absolutely. Uh, this is also why I've been talking in for the past 10 years or so about computational psychometrics because uh, uh, it's not only artificial intelligence. I mean, we call it intelligence, but I mean, there is, is, there is no such a thing. We tend to anthropomorphize it. At this moment, there's still a set of amazing tools that we can use. However, it's we can use. We, the, the expert developing the test, and we do so for, for humans. So we still need the, under, the theoretical underpinnings of learning and assessment and what is, and we are learning still, the science itself is though, um, uh, developing further because, as I mentioned at the beginning, learning nowadays is digitally mediated. So a lot of experiences are different from how they were even, uh, you know, ten years ago or you know last century. So uh, while the science itself is developing and we are looking at this digitally mediated learning environments, we still believe that 
the design of these tools is extremely important. And often there is a lot of research being put into designing the right type of questions that could be the most useful uh, for teaching, providing diagnostic, providing recommendations, and eventually for measurement. So I absolutely agree with you. We, we cannot ignore the theory. Uh, and this has been my experience across multiple type of assessments and transitions of an assessment, say from paper and pencil to a digital environment, or nowadays with a DT directly in this digital environment. We need the, we, we need the pillars, the theoretical pillars for it. Thank you. Wonderful. Christina, were there any specific questions from the chat? Uh, we didn't necessarily have questions. I have two things that I would love to bring up. First, uh, our librarian, Sue Worthman, sort of made some connections between this technology that Alina shared today and uh, where library sciences is going, using some of this AI to do things like systematic reviews and, and being able to pull the appropriate data for the appropriate purpose. So I don't know uh, if you want to speak to that. And then we just got a great comment from Evan Sanders. Evan, thank you for your comment. He's thinking about scale when it comes to this large scale medical education that this can be that is this can be challenging we're using advanced technology psychometrics can be really challenging um so you know how wide of a scope is this technology good for um you know for our communities so for the library for sure um i think that I actually, I think there has been quite a lot of success in uh, information technologies as uh, courses of study. So like Carnegie Mellon has inform uh, information technology or information science. So they've been, they are extremely up to date in terms of educating people. Uh, I don't know how many of them will be librarians in, in a traditional sense of the word uh, or just the new generation of librarians. Uh, but definitely all of this uh, um, approach, especially the tagging of content, the creation of metadata for content, uh, all, all of that is, uh, is being studied and is being developed within this information uh, system and information technology field. Uh, so I would recommend people who are interested in librarian. Yeah, nothing is traditional anymore. Someone commented. Um, definitely, that's that's the case. And some things are good this way. I mean, definitely scale is one of them. Now, the other question was the comment was about um, how can we how can we achieve, how can we reach out to learners that, ha, uh, that are in small cohorts and uh, well, so once you have the systems in place, let's say you know that something works for a large cohort. Uh, I mean, it depends what it is. So if we talk about content, if we talk about developing learning instructional materials, uh, that data has a different N of a sample size. So what we are talking there would be the number of uh, documents or the number of questions, the number of books, say in your case, on medicine or different topics. So the data has a different definition there. So you could still develop tools and questions based and provide that metadata for individual questions based on text. So without necessarily having students taking the test and you can have humans evaluate human raters evaluating those tests and providing say SAS or a subset of them and providing an estimated difficulty and then the machine learning will generate more text and will apply that uh, that alignment and, and that's possible you don't need a lot of test takers to do that now let, ideally we would have some cohorts on which we will try this out but Another way to do it would be to apply these tools, apply this instrument that was developed exclusively by content uh, data and subject matter expertise in evaluating that to smaller cohorts. And once you, let's say once a year or so, you can pull the data together and 
check whether the alignment still holds. So there are systems in place that one can create alignments as, as the data comes in. So that would be the context of a Bayesian approach uh, where one could do that. So I wouldn't, I, I would keep separate. I think that's part of the uh, innovations here is the difference between having a big N for test takers and learners versus having, having a big N on the sources for content. And I see, I, I believe there is another question. Uh, Thanks. I also saw Evan, uh, whose who's, uh, response that was uh, online. Evan, did you have any, uh, did you have any specific um, examples you were thinking of there or did that make sense? It's, it's really, thank you so much. Um, and that was a great response to, to, um, to keep these, keep those bits separate. <laughs> um, and certainly I think that could provide an argument for trying off the shelf uh, products, for example, because maybe I think what's hard in a sort of cost benefit um, question is, you know, how do you, like when you're kind of under resourced already, could you really go out and develop your own platform for something? Um, certainly there are platforms that do exactly this that are targeted for, you know, learners of, of medicine um, I think then there's maybe an issue of culture because I know, I know that some of those may be popular with learn, learners, but uh, Harvard is, is, seems to be a little bit biased against off-the-shelf <laughs> products and approaches, and we like to kind of... Hello? Um, am I breaking up? Sorry. I'll, I'll try turning my video off. You, you think being in the office actually would give me access to better internet, but we've had problems for weeks. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Uh, I mean, the other thing that we, you know, have to consider is, you know, I, I think when it comes to medical knowledge and testing of medical knowledge uh, for our courses, it's, um, I don't see a huge demand, even though people might think it's kind of cool but there's not sort of a huge demand for developing these new types of psychometrics. And again, since we're a residential learning community, a lot of assessment is sort of happening, you know, in a room with an instructor and a small number of learners. And I do think that there is a, there is a place for figuring out how to assess that well. And I'm not saying we're perfect there, but I think it's hard to kind of figure out where all these pieces come together and what we should be focusing on. Um, so no, I, sorry, I still don't have a question, but just a lot of observations, and I'm really glad to have been invited by Eric today. If I may, um, I, I beg to differ actually on uh, the, the on the statement that you might not need these tools if uh, if you have smaller cohorts interacting with their instructors. Um, we are working nowadays within a telemedicine component. So we have both. You meet with people online and you meet with people in person. Um, teaching a, um, a, a medical student how to interact in these situations and training them for virtual environments, especially on, say, communication and clarification and even body language, I believe that could be very relevant tools. I've been involved with an uh, with a grant from the um, oh, um, uh, military medical. I, I'm trying to get the name right. <laughs> so anyway, it, it was a military medical science uh, provider. I'm, I'm blanking on the exact name. And one area of interest for them was on training. Um, multiple groups of medical army students to react in emergency situations such as, um, you know, a, a, a sudden explosion somewhere and how you would react, how do you collaborate with each other in such an environment where you have to take care of someone who is injured, take care of yourself that you are not becoming injured and communicate with others. So it's an example where actually the cohorts were very small uh, that we were working on identity using this the 3D technology and using a quite interesting and fancy environment where we were capturing the 3D 
position of people in the field in different situations. And we're trying to build training tools for them based on what we learned from uh, this environment. The cohorts, again, were very small, but the type of data that we were collecting, again, the content data, the images, and the human evaluator that we were using to train the system was not that small, and, uh, and we were able to provide to develop a prototype for that. Another example is, um, again, we can nowadays have a better understanding on how learners process information. But if we don't capture that process, then of course we can't say that much about how they do it. Um, so many of the online uh, or computer-based assessments and learning system offer or the opportunity to say, write in a chat bo box, collaborate with others, look for, resources. I mean, you, there are nowadays assessment that would allow the student to make use of resources to respond because you are not so much looking whether or not all the time whether they can regurgitate information. You are looking for whether they can make use of different sources of information. And integrating that within an assessment can be also done for smaller cohorts. So I think there is quite a lot of opportunity. We just have not really taken advantage to that. But to your other point with uh, shelf products, again, it depends what is the shelf product for. I agree with you that you know very generic shelf products may not be very useful for all uh, purposes, but it depends what it is. For example, a Google Doc is an amazing shelf product for evaluating how people collaborate in writing documents. And you have all the data you need. So let's say you are interested in helping them you know, write better and also work with others when writing. Google Doc is a perfect shelf product that you would use the output of to evaluate, gather that different types of data and create uh, your own assessment based on that. So it depends what it is. Wonderful. Thanks, Alina. And thanks for that great observation, Evan. Um, I know Masa has a, quest has a question. Um, we are at the hour, though, so I was thinking that perhaps we could follow up um, uh, by email to answer to you specifically Massa around that question or perhaps to the group as a whole. We do do a summary of the session that uh, Christina and the team will be working on and perhaps we could include the response in that. I just want to say thank you so much to Dr. Von Davier for this wonderful session. It's really opened my eyes to thinking differently about actually what kinds of data we might have and even with small cohorts there might be some areas of big data um, that are easy to leverage. Eric, did you want to say anything before we signed off? No, just fantastic, Alina. I thought so practical and the real world experience really gives us food for thought. So I um, appreciate it very much. Look forward to where we're going and this field moves so fast, but I appreciate also everyone's ability to jump on uh, during this lunch hour and uh, invite you back for our next session as well and, uh, and more to come. So thank you so much to everyone. Have a great weekend ahead. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Narad. Thank you for having me here and thanks to everyone who asked questions and attended. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. 